This tutorial looks at the difference between processes and threads. Now, processes and threads are fundamental concepts in any multitasking operating system, such as Unix, OS X, Windows. There are many tools in all these operating systems that allow you to manipulate and shut down processes to look at threads and thread priorities and try to see how your system is, is functioning. But first, we're going to look at how basic CPUs work to give you a background on talking about processes and threads. So we're first going to look at a simple program. So let's suppose we have a simple four-step program that gets a number three, gets a number four, adds those numbers together, and stores the result in memory. Every program, um, every step of a program, is converted to what's called an instruction. Now instructions in computers all have a binary code. So here's an instruction and they're all unique to the CPU. So if you had uh, a Pentium CPU, uh, a GET3 instruction would have a certain binary co uh, code, but if you were using a totally different, like an ARM CPU could have a totally different binary code. And all these codes, they're called the instruction set. So all these codes are in binary, but often people don't work very well with zeros and ones. We often shorthand this and write binary as a hexadecimal number just because it's easier for us to, uh, to manipulate and talk about. Now the basic CPU system or computer system has a CPU at its center and system memory or RAM. For instance, in your personal computer, you might have one gigabyte, two gigabyte, four gigabytes of system memory. Now we're not talking about the hard disk or any optical disk. We're talking about the system RAM. And a program or these binary codes have to reside in system memory in order to be executed. So somewhere in our system RAM, we'll have this program that we want to execute. So if our program is on a hard drive, one of the first things that it has to do is transfer it to system memory. Now, that program is, is then um, read by the CPU. It's transferred to the CPU over one of the computer buses. There are many different types of buses, address and data buses and control buses, and they all work together a lot of parallel lines to move all these bits into the CPU at once. Now, once the program goes into a CPU, you can think of it as going down a long queue to be processed. So all these instructions work their way down this queue. So 3C was the last instruction. Now this long queue is often given the name pipeline. And the CPU executes all these instructions using various components inside the CPU. So for instance, we might have a, a math processor, which will do adds and subtracts, some multiplies, can even do um, scientific math. And we have multiple components which do some other parts, but we'll just call it the execution engine. And so, what sort of is the heartbeat for every CPU is a little clock that runs at a certain frequency. So for instance, this clock might run at 2 gigahertz. And it might go to various stages in the pipeline. Pipelines actually have stages before a, an, ex, uh, an instruction gets executed. But eventually, it gets executed. So that's the basic operation of a CPU. Now we can think of this program as actually a thread. So if we have our CPU here, 
and we have our program coming in as a bunch of instructions. And maybe these instructions are from an application and we'll use maybe Microsoft Office Word application. As they come in, we can think of this as a unit of execution. Which means it's a collection of instructions which together form some specific task. And that's called a thread. So this thread uh, is being read into our CPU. So here we have a single threaded uh, application. And that was how things worked in the days of MS-DOS and command line uh, based operating systems. Very quickly when Windows came in and Mac OS X we quickly moved to uh, a multitasking operating systems where we had wanted to have multiple applications um, open at once. So we may have a second application, maybe Excel spreadsheet, and it has its own set of instructions that are being executed to carry out its task. Maybe it's generating a recalculate on a spreadsheet. And so now we have a second thread that we want to execute and we want it to appear to the user that's being executed at the same time. So in all um, operating systems were modified to introduce a new component in here. And this component is called the scheduler. And it was a software component that basically controls these instructions getting to the CPU pipeline to be executed. So you can think of it in this case as having being able to handle the two threads and it really being just like a switch that can change positions from here to here. And depending on the position of the switch, if the switch is up here, this thread or these instructions go to the CPU to be executed. And this switch can change to the bottom position and then this thread goes in to be executed. And this is what happens in today's multitasking operating system. Now when this switches back and forth it actually does so uh, on a regular basis. And that regular basis is called a time slice. So for instance, maybe the time slice is one millisecond. So in one millisecond, we could actually execute thousands of instructions from Word, and then we're gonna switch over and we're gonna execute thousands of instructions from Excel. And we're gonna switch back and forth every one millisecond. Now as humans to us, this is gonna happen so fast it appears that everything is happening at the same time or simultaneously. This type of multitasking is called preemptive. Preemptive multitasking because uh, it doesn't rely on any of these applications to give up control. This scheduler is simply going to take control away from one application and give it to another and work it back and forth. What's nice about that, if somehow Excel crashes, it's not going to crash your operating system. Yes, you may lose a time slice, but when you go back here, your Word program is going to work fine. And when you notice this is hung, you can actually just close it down by hitting the close button on your uh, GUI. Now, threads have other unique characteristics as well. They also have something associated with them called a priority. And a priority is simply a number. 
Some systems use 1 to 32, 1 to 99, so we'll say this has a priority of 10, and this has a priority of 2. Now, built into the scheduler, usually most schedulers simply give the highest priority thread um, a passage to the CPU. So what would happen here is this thread would get executed, and it would just stay in this thread because this is lower priority. There's usually multiple parts to a scheduler, and part of the scheduler's duty is to boost priorities of threads which don't get executed. So we'll go down here and we'll execute this thread for one or two time slices, and then we'll boost this. Execute, boost, and eventually this thread will get up to the same level, and then both threads well then what's called round robin. They'll both be executed a time slice until the thread's finished being executed. So this is how a multitasking operating system works. Now we talk here about multi-threaded applications because most programs today, and so we're going to look at a program called Word, and now we're going to call this a process. So a process is really a name for uh, a program. But most programs today are multi-threaded. So, for instance, you may have one thread or unit of execution which is just looking for keyboard input, waiting for the user to type something and then putting it on a screen. Maybe you've hit the print key but or the print function. But when the print function happens, you don't want to wait for that print to be completed. You're going to get control back to your word processing program. So another thread is spawned. Another uh, bunch of instructions are sent or created and sent to the CPU, which take care of printing in the background. You may want to save a file. That can spawn another thread. So most applications today are multi-threaded. Now, today's CPUs need to be different than they were 20 years ago because we have these multi-threaded OSs multi-tasking OS and we have multi-threaded applications. So today's CPUs are designed to be able to handle multiple threads more easily and one of the first systems was uh, on a single CPU was something called hyperthreading. And we talked about this thing called a pipeline inside a CPU. And what hyperthreading did was it duplicated a part of this pipeline. So at least it could accept two threads. It didn't duplicate some of the execution engine or the math coprocessor. So sometimes you would have threads that would start into these two pipelines but would have to be put on hold while they waited for maybe the math processor if they both had to do some math. But it did allow multi-threaded applications to work a little quicker. A better and generally faster way to handle multi-threaded applications are the today's multi-core uh, CPUs where we have a single CPU and we have more of the pipeline and the execution engine being duplicated so we would have a pipeline and we would have its own execution engine at least partly. The best solution is actually to have multi-CPUs two separate CPUs on a motherboard and many servers have this type of setup and this is called symmetric multiprocessing, the most expensive. Multi-core 
seems to be where most of the energy is going for the designs these days is you had four core or eight core uh, CPUs that handle multi-threaded uh, applications. So this was designed as a little introduction to the difference between processes and threads. So the process is really the program or application that's running. And these programs have many threads that can be spawned as they're executing. And each of these threads have different priorities. And as we're going to see later, there are many tools for manipulating um, the shutting down or viewing of threads and thread priorities.